there's still some terminology that we weren't always all on the same page about. So coordinate systems and other basic concepts. So uh, coordinate systems, alignment, rigid body transformations, digital elevations and models and point clouds, orthophotos and parallax. So maybe most of you know this, but uh, we just want to make sure we have some language that's consistent. So, you know, the, this is the, what is the reference datum. And so we talk about, you know, it's the same surface or elevation that that all of all points on the earth that remains constant over time. And so we talk about, um, you know, the the geoid is the the surface that has the exact same gravitational acceleration. But we know, depending on the density of the, the Earth and the near surface, the geoid moves around. So it's not a sphere, it's kind of like a potato. Uh, and then the Earth's topography is similar to uh, the geoid, but not exactly. And the geoid is very much close to the sea surface. Uh, and and so, so that's useful to think about. And then, we may try to fit these uh, with some kind of representation, which is an ellipsoid. And that helps us say, you know, where something is kind of latitude, longitude on the earth. And so what's a key issue for, for us in practice is to know which one we're using. And so you typically want to just have a modern one. And that means the, the year is, is at least 1983 or newer. So the big players are like, most common one that's used is WGS84. And Chris is a, an expert of, of this topic and could speak more to it. But you have to just be cautious once in a while, you'll see something come to you in a NAD27 or some other uh, older ellipsoid. And that can cause a big difference in terms of position uh, com com comparisons. So we always want to re we want to be uptight about this. We want to say, okay, I did it in WGS84. It's mapped in that, that reference data. Uh, and then we want to talk about map projections as well. And so there are many ways to, of course, take what's the surface of the earth and project it to a piece of paper, to something in 2D. And our most common one that we use, let's say, especially in the, well, pretty much everywhere, is this transverse representation. And so there we often use the UTM or Universal Transverse Mercator Geographic Coordinate System. So we've divided the Earth into many UTM zones. And each UTM zone has a kind of a false origin because I think surveyors, they don't like to have negative numbers. And so, you know, the origin is kind of over here, 500,000 meters to the, the kind of the west of of the center of the zone. And it's from there we measure horizontally and, and uh, or, sorry, east, easting and northing. And uh, if we're in the Southern hemisphere, uh, we, we um, start with the equator being 10,000 and you know, have the same origin here, but um, you know, start and go north. So we always have positive numbers and we're, we need to know if we're in the North or Southern hemisphere. But the, the use of this is because many things we're studying are sort of hundreds of meter scales for many applications. And so it's better to be in a UTM coordinate system because the horizontal distances are in meters and the verticals are in meters. And so that lets us sort of think in almost a Cartesian simple 3D coordinate system. You know, once if we have bigger problems, then we, we need to worry about how that deals with Earth's curvature, but most problems we study are small enough that we most often work in UTM. Uh, and, and that most mapping software, Metashape can handle it and exports things uh, in, in UTM, no problem. So the other thing, and we have a few state survey people from the US here. So, oh, sorry, uh, I'll come to state plane in just a moment, but here's the zones, the UTM zones of the world. So like, you know, Arizona, where I am, is UTM zone 12. I work a lot. East Africa, UTM zone 37, or Central Asia is UTM zone 42. So you kind of need to know which one you're in, but once you're in it, you rarely leave it. And, uh, and then you kind of work all in meters. So the other thing um, is for the US and every country, you often have some something more arcane coordinate systems that it may use. 
but the US in particular has this arcane system called the state plane. And so you see like Arizona has three state plane zones um, and they can be difficult also because they're often in feet, but you may still need to work in a state plane uh, coordinate system for some applications or you would get data in state plane. But as long as they're well-defined and the definitions are coming from something called the EPS, EPSG code, it, it explains what is the coordinate system, its definition. And so then if we have a well-defined coordinate system, almost all GP, GIS software can go one to the other without loss of any significant accuracy. So just some background people should be aware of. Main thing is, I think, is latitude, longitude versus UTM. So aligning point clouds. And so Chelsea's a real guru of point cloud alignment. But one of the key things a lot of times we need to do, especially when we have more than one survey, is to get them aligned. And so this monkey head is trying to show it. And this comes from uh, also the medical industry. Like if you do some, some sonogram, and then you do another sonogram, a lot of times you need to see if there's been change. And so we use something like this, which is called the iterative closest point approach, which lets us align point clouds by basically doing a rigid body transformation. So what that means is we're rotating and translating one point cloud to get it aligned with the other one. And so um, this includes this kind of geometric transformation with you see the matrix there, but basically we're, we're talking about the rotations, alpha, beta, and gamma around the principal axes. And then the TX, TY, TZ would be the translations in those three axes that we need. So we divide it up by the coordinate directions and go on. So the last thing that I like to point out for this monkey face is it's a good example of this progressive rotation. The only thing that's not totally accurate about or realistic is that the points are exactly the same. And so you can imagine sort of a perfect fit. But in most applications, we actually have two different surveys of the same mon monkey face. So the points aren't sampling the exact same points. So we're, but it's the same head. So we're sort of finding the best fit of the cloud of points, not just point to point. So, um, and so we often use something called a cloud to cloud or cloud to plane, we're sort of minimizing these distance iteratively. And as I said, Chelsea's kind of a guru of that, but but you, uh, we could speak more about it, but just kind of picture this in your head. A couple more final points are data types. And so uh, this is a LIDAR based example, but it's relevant as well, or a useful comparison with the structure for motion. And so this is something also coming from open topography in our browser-based point cloud viewing system. And so we're looking at a bunch of points. We're looking at, I think this is like 80 million points. So each point is an X, Y, Z point with some attribute, which in this case is the classification. Is it vegetation or uh, ground or structures? That's what the orange is there. And so we can, with this kind of classified point cloud, we could say, okay, show me everything or just show me the, the ground points. And so this is a key point and it works really well for LIDAR. It doesn't work as well for structure for motion. I just wanna make that clear for everyone because the, the, the points that we get from the structure for motion are gonna mostly get the top because that's what the camera sees. And sometimes it'll be able to reach down and we'll get a point on the ground, but it doesn't always work. So we have much more sparse ground points in the SFM point clouds. And there are ways to improve it so that you could do the same kind of classification and um, kind of pull the vegetation out, but we can't expect to do this so well with the SFM point clouds. Because remember here, the, la la the laser is shooting with some power and, and seen under the trees or through the leaves. So another quick definition, and probably most people have this in mind, but what is the difference between a point and a digital elevation model? And so this is a map view where we have points. In this case came from LIDAR, but could also be from structure from motion. And you see they're scattered. They're all over kind of non-uniform sampling of the ground surface. And so, 
what we might want to do, and for most of our GIS work, we're taking these 2D representations of the 3D environment, and uh, we have to rasterize them or grid them. And so we have to estimate using some kind of averaging approach, the elevation in this case, or color for an orthophoto for some set sized pixel. And so the size of the pixel, sometimes we call it the resolution. So this is like a one meter digital elevation model. And we can do that estimation using different methods, triangular irregular networks, splines and Krieging, local mins maxes. And um, this is a key step. And a lot of science is done on the rasterized products, but you kind of lose some of the three dimensionality when you do that. So sometimes we call this a two and a half D representation. So what that means is still, you know, easting and northing, but the elevation is a single elevation for each pixel. So we can't represent underhangs. We can't have two elevations at the same point, whereas in 3D, you can. And so here's the, that concept of a digital elevation model with these elevations. This is like a pyramid here, just showing. Um, and so the results, then we would say the general term is a digital elevation model. And you could have a digital surface model, which is the surface, which is mostly what we, we get from structure from motion. And a digital terrain model would be one where we've done our best to get rid of points representing the, tr the vegetation or the structures. And so we just want to try to get our language right. And so you'll hear us mostly now talk about digital surface model or DSM outputs from uh, Metashape. So just a cup. So one of the other big products that we get from Metashape is something called an orthophoto. And it's really useful because it's basically an image map that is from all the, the pictures projected to a single plane. And so the idea is like if you're looking over, if you're in a in a drone or in a in, as a bird above some buildings in a city, let's say you'll see this parallax, you see this perspective view, you know, the bottom of the building is not as the same as the top, right? And that's fine, that's how we know the 3D. But if we wanna sort of slice this or project it to a single horizontal plane, like for the map, we need to correct for that 3D effect. And so that's what an orthophoto does. And so that's, that's why the orthophoto needs the three dimensionality to sort of do this projection correctly. But once we have it, then, you know, distances on the map are correct or consistent. So then just a couple final points that I added this slide, because many of you are interested in really in 3D problems. And so it's key to re understand, you know, sort of the 3D point cloud representation of something like this. This is a pillar, a rock pillar. It's called the totem pole. So it's a climbing uh, destination in Arizona, but we've used it also as a seismometer kind of to see if it shakes during earthquakes. And so how do we represent it using the products from structure from motion? So here's the totem pole with, whoops, sorry, this should say, um, I don't know where the my annotation went, but this is like 500,000 points here in a dense cloud. And then I start taking away the second picture is about 100,000 points. And the next picture would be a more sparse cloud, but sort of only about 20,000 points. So those are just 3D points that are colorized. So that's X, Y, Z plus R, G, B for each of those points. And it's in, it's in strong contrast then as you represent the 3D object with then a mesh. And so a mesh triangulates those points to make this enclosed surface. And then onto that mesh, we would, might paint the colors we call the texture map to give it color. So I think it's, again, it's kind of this lecture is just some terminology, but it's important that you kind of get the idea of point cloud sampling and then the concept of meshing. And a lot of what we do now are sort of standard products, like from the mesh, you can make a DEM, just sample it in 2D, but also you can export the meshes into 3D environments, like for your Oculus Rift, or if you go to Sketchfab, you go with the, the textured mesh. And so one of the things we did with the, with the uh, pillar was to sort of fit cylinders to it, because we cared about the, um, 
kind of the height width ratio, the aspect ratio. And so here's different attempts these different colors or different cylinders, kind of different diameters that are um, fit. So like a 1.4 meter cylinder diameter versus three versus four meters. Uh, and then this is all done inside of Cloud Compare, which is a software we use to analyze these point clouds coming from the SFM process. And I could get the height just by measuring as I show on the left there. So I show it's okay, it's 30, seven meters tall and it's between 1.5 or 1.4 and five meters thick. So that gives me a aspect ratio that then I can use to talk about the fragility of this to ground shaking. 